Uh, welcome everybody. We're having another Node Operator Round Tower. It's it's Wednesday, April the nineteenth, and uh, we'll kick things off today. It's a, the main item on the agenda is going to be hopes and dreams for Leap Five But before we get into that, I'll hand it over to Stephen to talk about the latest in the progress on on the software side of guessing for four point Yep, that's right. Um, so as was discussed last week, uh, we got. RC3 out um, about a week ago yesterday. Um, since it's been sitting a bit and things seem to be looking pretty good, um, I've not had any truly egregious issues come through. Uh, we do believe that we should be on track to likely go stable sometime early to mid next week. So we'll just be tracking against that. Um, we'll provide that update once we finally gotten there. And then um, that will, of course, be leap v4.0.0. Um, we're also closing in on an initial RC cut for CDT v4.0.0. Um, the versioning being the same number right now isn't any sort of uh, enforced convention. It's just coincidence that they happen to be the same version number. So uh, don't let that confuse anybody. Tomorrow uh, at 9 a.m. Eastern U.S. time, uh, we'll be walking through the uh, Antler Proj, uh, project and package management system that is part of all of that. Uh, if anyone would like an invite, I had a couple of people reach out after the last meeting, but um, that'll be a standing meeting every two weeks on Thursdays. Um, and that'll be RC1 for V4.0.0 for CDT. Um, that's the majority of the updates that we have related to the release process. Awesome, thank you. And that's this Thursday that we are doing the demo on CDT, is that right? That's correct. Or tomorrow. All right, awesome. Well, thank you, Stephen. Uh, any questions on that, anybody? Great. In that case, we can hand it over to Brian to uh, kick off the discussion on 5.0, Hopes and Dreams. Very good. Um, let me... I have a mostly empty doc, but I find sometimes the uh, conversations are easier to facilitate if we're like seeing what I'm writing down as I do it. So I'm going to share this and let's see if it worked. Yes, it did. Oh, that is an empty doc. Yep. Cool. So I say 5.0 here, but um, to be honest, like let's raise the gaze a little bit and just say, you know, um, it, for the future of antelope, right? Uh, and the reason for that is because there might be something that you're um, that you'd really like to see that you think is huge that's small, and vice versa. There might be something that you like to see that you think's easy, and it turns out that it's a big kerfuffle to to build it, right? Um, so don't worry about the um, level of effort involved as we go into this. Um, what I'm looking for is just, you know, what are the things that um, you think that we should be building for antelope? Uh, obviously, we have a, we've had these conversations uh, less directly over, uh, you know, a long period of time. And so we have our own sort of hypotheses on what some of these things might be. Um but, you know, I want to I want to sort of talk about it directly and and go from there. Some of the things that are worth um, sort of thinking about um, from from the standpoint is like you know one is obviously uh, you know what do you want right as a node operator? Um, uh, you know, then there's there's things about like. Um, you know, what are the sort of moonshot things that uh, that could drive um, antelope forward? Right. And then there's sort of like, what are the small bets we can make to see if something's impactful, right? Um, so these are the things that like, we don't know if it's it's not obvious that it's going to drive antelope forward in a meaningful way, but um, it could, right? And and it's small enough uh, to be worthwhile. Then there's, you know, a category that I call remarkability, right? Um, which is, you know, like, what are the, the wow things that would get people talking? What are the 
controversial things that could get people talking. Right. So, you know, we do something in a, in a way that specifically might make people say, why would a blockchain do it that way? That seems weird. Right. But it, you know, gets people talking. Uh, there's pragmatic features, right? So, uh, the thing that I think about here, whoops, I lost my cursor is the lighters and pain relievers, right? So what are the things that are, uh, making your life easier? What are the, wow, I misspelled that. Um, what are the things that like take away a pain? Um, this is, this can be for node operators or, um, users. And so from that perspective, I'll say, what do you want as a, it's a loop networks user, I guess I should say a user of a net antelope network. Um, and those, those are the big, the big sort of categories. Just, I'd put those there more as a context setting, like, so that if you, um, if you find yourself, um, sort of struggling to feel like you have something, uh, to add to this, um, you know, take a look at some of these and, and give it a shot. There's no bad ideas. Actually, bad ideas are really useful um, because uh, what might be contained in what seems like a sort of cockamamie scheme uh, that's in your head might be the kernel of something that completes somebody else's, um, you know, also cockamamie thing and makes it into like, wow, this is this is a really um, good direction for the network. So. This is very much a, um, the context of this conversation is very much a, let's not critique any of the ideas at this stage. Let's just like get them listed and sort of, uh, if you're familiar with sort of improvisational, uh, techniques, the, 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 uh, there's an idea of saying yes and right. So don't, don't try to reject somebody else's idea, but do build on it, right? Like, oh, that would be cool. And right. And at the end of the day, uh, the pragmatism will come later. Like the, eh, this, we need to knock this down several notches to make it realistic. You know, that, that can come later. So with all that context set, I do want to do this a little differently than, uh, usual, which is usually it's very unstructured and, um, then like we, you know, I just sort of have an open forum. I would like to actually kind of go, uh, person by person here with this question of if you had a genie's lamp and could have three wishes for the future of antelope features, what would you wish for? Right. Um, and at one more note on that, I say antelope features. If there's, if it's instead, you don't know what the feature is, but it's a problem even better. Right. Um, so problems to solve. Right. Um, and so with that, uh, before I just call on, if I call your name and you're like, I don't have anything that's, that's fine. I'll give you a few uh, few moments to speak up, and if if you don't, I'll just assume that you don't have anything. I'll call someone else. Before I do that, does anybody want to volunteer to be the first to speak up? I'll go first. Great. Thanks, Ross. <laughs> so it's been discussed before, and I know that there has been some kind of optimizations that um, have gone into the the current release candidate, but I would really like Genie's Lamb stuff, dynamic peer discovery, and selection of uh, the optimum path. So, you know, to look at like uh, routing protocols, like an OSPF type thing, some kind of idea that there is a metric associated with the amount of latency between peer A and peer B or bandwidth between peer A and BP, or, you know, some, some kind of uh, table that is dynamically built for um, a selection of which is going to be the, the best path. Okay, so that's basically latency. I, not quite late, it's not quite latency optimization. It's more about selection. So you can discover the peers, mm -hmm. and then you select the best peer based on latency or bandwidth or whatever the criteria is number of, I suppose it wouldn't be hops then, right? Whatever. It'll be, you know, some, something that, that you know, that the, the peer that is selected is going to be the, the best peer. Right. And 
Um, and I'm sure I'll think of a third one in a bit. But I, I, I didn't have it right now. I just I went yeah, first, and that's what that's what back. popped up. We'll we'll yeah. just barely go a little deeper with these uh, before we move on. Um, so with dynamic peer discovery, um, is there anything more you can say about um, uh, like what? How would you know that you got your wish? Well, you'll be syncing blocks with uh, to the chain. You turn the node on, maybe there's an option in config.inr. You go and you put the config in, it's saying dynamic selection. You know, a lot of I know a lot of us BPs like to force where we where we link to, that's all good. But mm -hmm. it then enable the protocol of uh, discovering peers, some kind of hellos, some kind of timers, something. And um, you'll know you got your wish because you didn't configure a peer and the 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 blockchain was synchronized. Cool. So really, this is this statement here applies to both one and two, right? Well, or two is more on uh, you know that uh, you are syncing really quickly. Oh, okay. You are not dropping blocks. Um, yeah. A lot of the issues we have when you have a latent peer that's being used is because of what you got. You know, if you go and throw in, you know, twenty odd peers, one of them is running out of an Arctic. For me, it'll be really fast. For you guys in the states, it'll be slow. <laughs> All right. All right. So just to recap, we've got dynamic peer discovery, and you know you got your wish when uh, you sync blocks without having to configure peers and automatic selection of best peers uh, based on latency bandwidth hops, et cetera, something, right? Um, and you know you got your wish because uh, syncing is fast and you're not dro dropping blocks. Yeah, yeah, I think that's good. Cool. And we can come back around for wish three if it occurs to you. Do we have a next volunteer? I could share some thoughts. I'll, I'll frame it more as the, as the problem. Um, so EOS began in the early days with this kind of Ethereum killer mentality. And we've now kind of realized that that was a bad strategy. And and we are seeing with EVM coming online, all this sort of stuff that, that the better strategy perhaps is how can we be more of a friendly cooperator in the broader Web3 space an Ethereum enabler and and beyond Ethereum, just Web three general. We you know we're, we're the it's becoming more and more clear that you know the future is going to be multi chain, and how can Antelope serve a you know a be a friendly participant in that multi chain future and um yep. and create a welcome environment for people. So as a developer or as a business person building on EOS. How might we make sure that the technology is com more compatible with the other players in the blockchain space? Um, that th things on building on EO are portable to other blockchains and vice versa. All of the open source tools and libraries and all the things that's getting built for free by other foundations out there can be also leveraged by the developers here. Um, and on just one example and on you know, bias here is would be great if uh, EOS was compatible with the graph. Right. Um, that's where all the, you know, it's becoming the, the standard for data aggregation tools out there. So how might we, in, you know, let developers in the EOS ecosystem benefit from all the amazing things happening out there? Yep. Cool, and I know that it's uh, more of a problem-focused statement, um, but that is fine. Whoops, I am fighting with formatting, which is my least favorite thing in the world. Um, there we go. Um, so I know this is more of a problem-focused uh, statement, but uh, I think nonetheless, if the problem no longer existed, you would have your wish, right? So how about a statement of like what it would look like to have gotten your wish here? Um, it might so be these things that I read, wrote down, but if it's not, you know, if it's something more than that, let me know. Yeah. So it would, yeah, it would mean that, um, as someone developing something on EOS, 
the building blocks that are available to developers building on Ethereum are just as useful for me here. Um, and it would mean that when I build something on EOS, um, it can be, you know, it's compat it's compatible with all of the, the ecosystem out there. Like for example, my data on my EOS application is easy to be aggregated on the data aggregators on the browser web three space. So, you know, I build a DeFi app on EOS without a huge amount of effort, my data should start getting fed into all of the, you know, DeFi levels of the world. Uh, right now you need to build custom connectors for EOS to be able to feed into some of these, these aggregators, for example. Does this, does this work as sort of an abstract version of that statement? So building blocks made for Ethereum, well, that's a poor spelling, but Ethereum uh, are just as useful for me. And EOS app data is available to the broader blockchain ecosystem. Yeah, I think that captures it well. Cool. Now, I think there was a more specific wish here too, that I, like you mentioned some bias, but I think that's okay. So it sounded like, yeah. um, you, you know, you would like um, EOS to uh, be integrated with the graph. Did I, is that yeah. Right? And that's more of a political thing than a technological thing, probably. But when I think of products, it's more than just the tech. It's the whole package and support around it. Uh, so I think that you know the tech exists and to make this easy, but there's going to be some need to be some kind of biz dev right. work to to make that really truly officially supported. Yep. And I must feel silly asking this because uh, it's probably pretty obvious, but what would that look like? If you got your wish. <laughs> um, yeah, that would mean that. Uh, participants of the graph ecosystem could um, could leverage subgraphs that provide EOS data for their data aggregators. Maybe maybe the uh, it's really like Danny or Matthew could could provide some better more from a technical perspective um, what that would look like for a developer specifically. Oh. Okay, we're looking at something like that. Is there a, a third wish, or is that it for him? That's it for now. This is a stingy genie, by the way. Um, <laughs> he he uh, he he was up pretty late last night and only gives two wishes. Um, <laughs> with All right. I know Michael's probably itching to speak up. I'm just letting everybody else talk. <laughs> Would anybody... It's my turn. Yeah, I think... Uh, yeah, let's just do it. Let's do it. I guess I'll try to keep it simple on two. Um, really, as a node operator, because that's all I do. Um, I would say it would be sweet if we had... I'll refer to it as that get info two okay yep that additional administrative endpoint that expands on you know what exactly the node is doing running uh plugins the information about the 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 node itself anyway uh we've talked about that in some of those other conversations so it's kind of general that it's uh, get info two I, I know i'll get my wish when there's <laughs> a more powerful REST query that is, you know, in a JSON standard that can be used to better monitor and, and use the server. So obviously we could pick that apart a little bit more, but uh, yeah. for, for now, is that do you think that's a sufficient statement when you have a wrestling point with JSON output that serves all my node monitoring needs? 
Correct. That's what I say. It's been a bigger conversation. You can say oh, all of Prometheus info, but it, whatever it is. But yes, the idea is that 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 endpoint existed, and the other one is an endpoint. Uh, I really like that is ready. You know, based off of if the API is up, but it really shouldn't be used yet. Like it's syncing. Sorry, real quick. Is this is this part of Get Info too, or is this a separate wish? No, this this is this is my second wish. Okay, I, I rubbed the lamp again. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so that's what I would say. Those are my two. Is I mean, so sorry, I, I don't know much about the intention of is ready, and I, I cut you off. Could you restate the? Uh... You're fine. It. I think Aaron had actually kind of mentioned it live in one of the last calls, and basically to to help a node better indicate whether it's synced up and should be used or in like a health query. Does that make sense? Like the problem is, is you can get these nodes that are replay or resyncing or behind or whatever, and you really have to do intense health checking on it when the node knows that it's not in sync. So if it would be able to say, no, 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 I'll, I'll be back in a few, a few minutes or hours or whatever, load balancers and stuff can, can know yeah, I should use it as an API or does that make sense? That was. Yeah. It, is it more to it than just whether it's in sync uh, or, or. Yes. I mean, I'm sure there's some more intrinsics to it, but that's the one that always catches me is, you know, <laughs> or, and most people is it's in a load balancer. It needs to be restarted. It's reloading, crashing, you know, you have to recover from something, whatever, but um And you would know you got your wish when there's like a is ready endpoint that lets the uh, you know a, a 200 response or a, a JSON okay whatever it is that kind of lets the load balancer know yep I'm ready or any query I mean I'm using it as a load balancer but you could use it publicly as well check is is this node think it it's okay to start serving requests. Mm -hmm. Yes. No. Okay. Then use another one or, or whatever, but yeah. And this might actually, even though you said it was a different thing, this could easily be in the get info too, as well as what I put in. Yeah. Is the peer a good peer? Correct. Let's say, I mean, it could be rolled wherever. A Aaron had mentioned, you know, quick light when yeah. it returns a 200 status, because then you could use statuses and whatnot. But yes, that's what I say. I mean, it, it's really just a better ability. Like when it's replay, it knows not to turn the API on. But when it's syncing or... or it doesn't. Or yeah. 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 And, we, and it starts serving bad stale data and people can really pick yeah. up on that. Yeah. You know? um, even like state history fiends and stuff like that you know i mean it it doesn't realize it's not happy <laughs> yeah anyway so it, it, and, so, and and the worst is is when it's out of your control so you actually paired with somebody else right and and that is the the pair that's being used and they are behind for whatever reason you know all right are you going to keep up the trend of only having two wishes michael or do you have a third yeah, that's what I said. I'll, I'll, I'll go with those as my two. Great. Okay, cool. Keep it short. Oops. All right. Let's see. Um, I don't know the, um, the name behind the handle here, but Mockingbird Sparrow? Uh, yeah. Can you hear me again? Uh, yes, I can. Um, EFs is uh, considered a functional, more the most functional blockchain we have, or as functional as there is. Um, and um, it's been used uh, in South America and Africa for uh, brick and mortar things, uh, branding done um, at very low levels. And I thought uh, making it, uh, making things easier on that end. Uh, whether it's a uh, credit card device, as we know, uh, one or two blockchain stores launching with uh, their own mobile phones cheap. Um, so I don't know what developers will be involved in that, but anything that may, 
dear for anybody in the world to have to use. They have an internet connection to uh, virtually local lovely. So, okay, let me make sure I understand. So basically you're saying for ES to go in the direction of, of empowering uh, sort of developing markets, am I understanding that right? Uh, I'm looking even more even more small business. And by small business, I don't mean $100 million. Anybody with a business, they connect to the blockchain that's using credit cards instead. Gotcha. Okay. Goes for its ledger. But yeah, empowering small. Yeah. I'm in aviation, so. At least talk about supply chains, how to impact supply chains. I just thought it was too much to bring up. I live in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. But you put that it's wish too. Can I think to supply chains easier? So did I did I capture this already easier and more accessible payment processing for small businesses? Uh did I lose? Are you there? Can you hear me? Uh, me? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Hey, that, you got a thumbs up. You got a thumbs up. Sorry, I, I don't, don't know, know if you could. Does that capture the? Like, it sounds like there is also like a physical business, like point of sale devices, maybe part of that or something. It's not just digital transactions, but it's in person transactions. I think that you were trying to narrow in on. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, what if you could just uh, deliver a cheap uh, device that connects to EOS Ledger specifically for people doing businesses that they get rid of their accounting books anywhere? Don't need QuickBooks or anything. Is that possible? What would it take? Uh, All right. Well, I need to know you got your wish when. Anyone with an internet connection can... Um, Get put all accounting on EOS um, from uh, accepting delivery um, to uh, sale and uh, finding out uh, their uh, inventory. Something to that. Anybody with an internet um, can do their accounting on EOS, their business account on EOS. All right. Thank you. Is, uh, did you have a uh, third? Um... I'm in aviation, so I really got into, I chose EOS because of uh, international supply chains. But again, <laughs> you may want to note it, uh, I didn't want to get into it. All right. Very good. Um, let's see, who else we got here? Thank you, by the way. Um, Max. Yeah, Max, did, did you uh, did you have any wishes you wanted to share? Mm, sorry, I can hear. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Uh, did you have any wishes that you wanted to share? Um, I have no idea. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Not at all. Um, all right, I'll move it along. I think the next person I've got here is Aaron. A consensus change is fair game. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, anything's on the table. Um, whether or not we we as ENF can actually impact it, I still want to hear it. Um, because aside from being an entity that's sort of stewarding things, we're also community members, right? So. Hearing the ideas is still, um, you know, interesting and exciting. Uh, so, yeah. I think right now for the direction we're heading, the number one thing I'd say is uh, expiration dates on permissions. Okay. Um, and that is simply just a permission that you can specify a date at which it becomes invalid. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, interestingly enough... Uh, I previously explored this exact thing um, in another life, but also for ES. Um, <laughs> so, but I won't go into that. I, I'm curious about, um, can you give me a little bit more about the what you're trying to power with that specifically? It would be a, for temporary authors, authorization of apps, essentially. Um, you know, you're using an application with um, a wallet. 
Yeah. And it's annoying that every time you want to sign a transaction, your wallet has to pop up and you have to approve it. So if you could create a temporary permission that expired in, say, five minutes a day, whatever the time frame may be, that that way you could do transactions more easily within that application. Yep. You know, it might be a game, it could be a DeFi app, it could be whatever, but that permission would then expire in whatever the time frame was, you know, kind of the developer or you as a user could specify. Um, and then I guess my second wish to come along with that would be more granular permissions to be able to, to be able to like put a, like a really granular example would be putting a budget on a key, be like, you're allowed to spend 20 EOS on the EOS IO token contract, something like that. Yeah. Or. Um, you can power up, but the recipient has to be this account. Um, something that you can really, like we have granular permissions in that you can specify which contract and which action that he can perform. But if we could also specify rules that matched the data that was also being submitted. And then if it didn't match those filters that the transaction, like the permission wouldn't be valid at that point. Um, so those two features combined would really open the floodgates for a lot of cool uses to make the blockchain easier to use. Right. How awesome is it that we can even have this conversation? Right. About like this multi-tiered permission system. I mean, wow. <laughs> yeah. All right. So for let's let's go. Uh, well, actually, let me check first if you have a third, Aaron. I'm sure I do, but I'm struggling to come up with it. Yeah, no problem. I'm, I'm learning that two seems to be the cutoff. You know, it's funny. There's versions of this exercise, though, where you uh, you actually have everybody do it silently first. Um, and it's a, it's a quantity play. Uh, everybody has to come up with 20 ideas. <laughs> and then uh, you select, everybody selects their top few. But uh, the thought being that... Um, you know, when you have to come up with 20, uh, you come up with stuff that your brain wouldn't be able to come up with until it has that pressure. But anyway, that aside, um, so for the first one, ex expiration dates on permissions, um, what would tell you that you got your wish? Well, I could create a permission that has an expiration date. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, now I knew you'd be the one to uh, to the reply with the uh, <laughs> narky and obvious response. <laughs> I'm just joking. Cool. Yeah, I don't. I don't know how else to describe that. Like, it's just like I guess. And then it would be a feature that I'm assuming would have to be activated. So you know, BPs would need to enable it on chain as a feature or something. Yep. Cool. And then for more granular permissions, I feel like maybe this one's um, a little bit more broadly stated, so it might might need a little bit more specific. I knew my, I'd get my wish. Yeah, I think it's similar to the first one and the expectations, uh, you know, like when it exists. But I think it would be specifically um, when we have some sort of standard to write these things and apply them to permissions, you know, that one's going to be more complicated than the first one, but both together create this pretty powerful thing. Yeah. Um... We're writing uh, complex and granular. That, yeah. That's, I have a clear spec for writing complex and granular permissions. Yep. Cool. All right. Let's see. So I know that uh, I know that Kevin, you're not a node operator, but I'm still curious to hear hear what you have to say. Uh. Okay. How about um. Oh. Parallelization of uh, block validation. Oh man, you gotta give me a word that has a bunch of double this and that. Uh, parallel this really should be a uh, block, block uh, validate. Yeah. Yes. All right. Spelling content. Yeah. <laughs> uh wow, another word. Um, how about? Uh, 
Um, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, probably something else, um, performance related. Uh, so, uh, just let's say, um, a hundred thousand, uh, token transfers per second. We're gonna make that hundred million. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> um, well, per note, I guess with the idea, with you know, um, being able to scale that out horizontally, right? Yeah. What if we just split that to like yeah. horizontal scaling? Yeah, um, that works. Uh, cool. All right, so let's uh, let's take these uh, one at a time. How would you know you got your wish? Uh, well, for uh, prioritization block validation, the, you know, you get your wish when, uh, block validation was, um, you know, we're, we're magnitude faster than block creation. And one of the, one of the issues with the U S blockchain is that block validation is currently as expensive as block creation. Um, you know, and a lot of, uh, blockchains, that's not the case, right? It, it's a much more expensive operation to create a block than it is to validate the block where in the us it's effectively the same yep all right a uh, hundred thousand token transfers per second i think this one's kind of similar to where we just say yeah you just measure it right um and we're able to produce blocks with you know fifty thousand trans uh token transfers them right yeah yeah, I believe it like that. Yep. Okay. Uh, and horizontal scaling. Um, yeah, being able to demonstrate that you can achieve, um, say, a million transactions a second by scaling across multiple nodes. Yeah, so, so I know I got my wish when adding more nodes means I can... Uh, increase throughput, right? Okay. Very good. Let's see. Denis, yeah, I've got I've got one as a family, but there's probably some sub items in there. Um, and it's just the overall kind of improve the native resources on EOS. Mm -hmm. So like. A lot of it has to do with, um, you know, how we're pushing transactions, how we're allocating CPU and all of that. So within that, let's say, I think we've talked about it, having a single Ethereum, Ethereum mural resource. So everything that is a sort of a temporary resource, RAM, I think is always going to be RAM, but everything that's CPU and net, instead of having two resources to manage, having one resource to manage, kind of like, mm -hmm. I don't know gas or whatever we want to call it, just having it one to manage instead of two to manage, uh, which would then would fall back into just deprecating net entirely and then kind of putting net into that single resource. Um, and third is kind of like right now we have um, power up, which is a one day, um, a one day CPU sort of a allocation. What would be more interesting is kind of a low CPU cost one shot. Let's say you want to push a transaction and you only want to push that transaction only be able to kind of like just pay for the CPU of just that transaction, kind of like a one-time gas fee. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that Aaron with, uh, with Anchor Wallet, they kind of do that with the, hey, you want to pay for this one, one transaction and then you pay, you know, point zero zero five EOS. Um, that would make it much easier to manage resources because you can guarantee mm -hmm. that if you're using this, let's say a one shot CPU push transaction, it guarantees the CPU of that particular transaction. That way you don't have to maintain a daily balance or a monthly balance of CPU. So there's a lot of monitoring tools to just make sure that your account has CPU and it makes it 
just much more difficult because you can't just say like, hey, just pay for whatever transactions that I pushed. So mm -hmm. the third is like more of a one shot CPU allocation for just that transaction. Um, now, just to make sure I understand here, um, so you, you got kind of more specific and said CPU allocation. Or whatever that single resource, like something. Yeah, so when you say single resource, are you are you also mixing RAM into that or do you perceive huh. that being separate? I think RAM is maybe just separate because it's just a, okay. a different beast, but it's mostly yeah. just- So that's what you meant by ephemeral then is like- Yeah. It's like, yeah, okay. The temporary things uh -huh. that, yeah. Yeah, um, more about like capacity stuff, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think we would we would still always have two resources because RAM is more of a permanent resource, and then we have the temporary resources, which is the CPU and net. Um, yeah. I'll what's the word? Uh, so that I remember what this means later. What's the word for um, uh, like ability to serve? Like uh, how many you can serve at once? There's like a technical word for this. Capacity? Yeah, but this but capacity could potentially be applied to storage too. Well, okay, I won't make this a uh, vocab uh, quiz. I'll, I'll just stick with Yeah, I think Arig has said ephemeral as the temporary resource. Yeah, okay. Uh, technically, we kind of already have the low cost one shot CPU and it's essentially it's the use power up on every single transaction mm -hmm. it's quite a big beast of a transaction to kind of bundle on every single transaction sure but and that's a low cost optimized for CPU and I'm sure that uh I'm sure we can come up with something that's a little bit more efficient than having to power up your account on every transaction right but that is an alternative and it's actually pretty cost effective uh Compared to the maintenance, like compared to maintaining your balance of CPU, which is you're just paying before you actually do the transaction mm -hmm. instead of paying only on demand. So okay. it's just a different model. And I think we can probably have both running. We can have the daily top ups or the one shot top ups. I think we can live in a world where we have both options. But that's uh, those are my wishes. I would simplify a lot the on-chain trans transaction pushing. Yep. Cool. All right. So let's take this uh, one by one. Is is improvements to native resources um, sort of a wish in itself, or is it really just the category for this? It's category. It's more like what wish two and three is fulfilled. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's more of the category. Okay. Uh, and then I guess for these other two, um, the, with, uh, I know I got my wish win. Is, is, is there a separate statement for each of these or, or is it kind of just one for both together? Um, well, I mean, the, the single resource is just being able to manage one single affirmative resource. So let's say like when I don't have to manage net, then that's that, that wish is essentially solved. And the other one is just when I can do, when I can have zero CPU in one account, and still be able to push transactions, you know, atomically um, with that sort of top up or that one shot. So when I have zero CPU and I can still push a transaction and not have to not have to monitor my account, that's pretty much the other. All right, sounds good. And maybe it, is that um, possible? But I go, oh, I'm put lots of these little wishes. I think are. I think this is maybe in the realm of possibility, but a lot of discussion needs to happen on this one. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Some of these, um, this is why I sort of broadened it to not just 5.0. It's like some of these, we should be having the conversations, but, uh, it, it might take us to the time of releasing 5.0 just to have like decided the way forward rather than, <laughs> rather than having built it, but no, Agreed. Um, cool. All right. Um, so Tony. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I think, um, a, a, everything everybody's said is, uh, pretty valid. Um, and 
I'm just now getting into uh, playing around with some of the Prometheus stuff uh, from 4.0. So um, if I could bang the drum of monitoring a little bit more and go a step further and say maybe Loki integration for logging, um, if we're already hooked up to Prometheus, it's the next logical step. Um, let's see. Uh, BP monitoring, uh, some sort of better way to... Uh, um, obviously, at Grandmaster, we have quite a few uh, block producer nodes. Uh, something, and I know that there's split between Aloha and some of the kickbots, and um, something so it's just not, not Telegram is not the only option. Um, that would be, that would be outstanding. Something that where we don't have to use Telegram, where we could either pump that directly into Slack or, um, or there's some sort of API that we could call to get that information a little bit easier. Uh, sorry, I'm I'm lost on this one. So this is I, I I'm I think I'm learning about something that I'm actually not aware of yet. So what are, what are you using Telegram for as it relates to monitoring? Well, it's basically for um, it's used for most of the uh, for instance, Aloha uh, EOS puts out uh, uh, makes available a uh, Telegram channel for block producers to make sure that you're still producing. I see. Um, so unless Beck is pr pushing exactly what I need to be looking at. <laughs> um, yeah. So this is like a native solution for uh, BP monitoring. Um, so I guess it's to be more specific, it's for monitoring whether I am producing blocks. Is that right? Basically, whether or not you've missed the rotation, whether you're in the schedule, that kind of stuff. By the way, I don't think that's exactly what you're asking for. It's just an idea. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, but something definitely to take a look at, though. I clicked it open. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, I need to look at this. <laughs> um, yeah, I, 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 I don't want to go into three, but... Uh... Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> uh, so um, as far as uh, I know I got my wish... Um, when I can monitor a node's log in Loki, uh, and uh, um, perhaps uh, uh, gather information out of it, uh, aggregate data, um, be able to, yeah, uh, it's basically the same like Splunk or any other log monitoring tool. Um, so, uh, as far as the, uh, yeah, if if uh, as far as the second one, if I can. Uh, be able to um, see whether or not our BPs are online without having to go into Telegram. That'd be terrific. Um, but also in, in having that data aggregated into one place so we don't have four or five channels that we have to monitor. Um, yeah, that'd be stellar. Cool. So for one, I'd, I'd advocate then that it sounds like what you're more broadly asking for here is actually not Loki integration specifically. That's one of the oh. things we want, but it's like, uh, what is it like more, uh, logging solution integration options? Is that, uh, I mean, I'd prefer Loki specifically, um, over Splunk. Um, yeah. it's the free option. It's the, uh, it's frankly, it's, I think it's the better option. Um, so, yeah, but also it, it, it pairs nicely with Prometheus. They go hand in hand. They are you know, the same okay. thing. So, um, yeah. Very good. Thank you. Yep. Let's see. Uh, let's go to JP. Yeah. So... I guess going back to the first thing that that Ross had said about uh, dynamic peer discovery, I think it would also be great to um, just be able to manually add and remove peers while um, NodeOS is running. Um, Because there's a, a map plugin, can't you? We just have to have it disabled on public. Oh, you can? 
think so. I don't do it much, but yeah, you can uh, control your peers. That's why you shouldn't have the net plugin enabled on public nodes, right? Because people can disconnect your peers. Oh, well, damn. But maybe we you control them. Maybe you can't add and remove them, though. Aaron, do you know how exactly that works? You can connect and disconnect from peers. But can you add and remove a new peer via there? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. JP? Yeah. Bad peer. Yeah. Or you can just connect from a peer. Okay. Okay. How about yeah, their documentation of uh, peer management with NetPlugin? Yeah. <laughs> what will probably, probably help him is being able to expose that NetPlugin in that isolated environment, how y'all are specifying different ports. The problem is, is once you enable the net plugin on a public node, somebody else can do it for you. But if you can hide it, like we were talking about splitting out these abilities, yes, the tool exists, but he's been trained not to turn it on because when yeah. you do, you're going to, you can get wrecked. So that's probably, is that 4 or 5 Where was that falling in? That feature where we all split it out into the different ports. It would be 5 -0. Right now, it's still just a proposal. We went over it uh, either last week or the week before. I don't remember. Um, and with you, with you folks, and uh, we're going to go over it internally for like a final review, and then and then we'll um, hopefully begin development on it. So it, right now, it's targeting 5.0, but work hasn't officially started other than building the proposals. So it fits. So okay. what about this? Better peer management, probably with the net plugin, security and isolation documentation. Like it seems like what you want is still valid, right? It's it's better better peer management. Um, why? I would even say maybe via API, right? Because that's what you're asking for, JP, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. Do you have another one? Uh, so maybe this was changed as well, and I don't know. But uh, I do recall at one point after deleting my state database on a ship, uh, starting NodeOS backup, uh, not using a snapshot, but the default behavior was to completely wipe out my state history. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I think that default behavior should be changed if it hasn't already, because uh, I've had several ter terabytes of data just be completely wiped out. And, uh, yeah, I don't know if anyone else has experienced that. Oh, I like Kevin up with that rat, too, and uprooted it that way so many times. Yeah, it's fixed. fixed. Yeah, that's fixed. Um, I think we even backported that fix. I'll have to check. Oh, this is great. My... My uh, wishes are immediately granted. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The so there might be something hidden. No, but there might be something hidden in this about um, sort of release transparency documentation and uh, upgrade process, right? So that you could take advantage of those changes. Well, I imagine it's probably in release notes on GitHub, maybe, and I missed it. I don't know. Yeah, I'm sure it was better that, there. We have I'm continuously iterating on making the release notes better, uh, but um, I mean, it's certainly mentioned there. Uh, whether whether the way it's mentioned is sufficient is another question. But um, what happens to us is, you know, you jump so many versions. There's so many different release notes that that's where all those get lost. It's almost like that feature matrix to where JP could say, "Last I remember looking, it was two dot twelve." Where the hell are we at with 3.2 now? Oh, yeah, this and this and this. And, and, you know, there's a lot of informational pieces, but... And some of those big points, like, hey, JP, guess what? The new version has a resource monitor that at 90% of your disk space, it's going to, by default, shut that node down. That <laughs> if you don't know it, it catches you. So, a matrix like that. I've been caught 50 times. Your fault, Michael. Your totally fault. on me. Totally cunt me here. <laughs> All right. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing. We are we are uh, at time right now. Um, there were 
uh, still a couple of folks that we didn't get to hear from. Um, I think, I think luckily, maybe actually it might just be, uh, Matthew Darwin that we didn't hear from and needs to didn't have anything important to add up from. <laughs> yeah. So I might, I might just briefly come back to this, uh, next week. I don't, other than that, I don't, uh, have a topic in mind yet, but we, we can discuss it in the, um, the node operators roundtable telegram group. And with that, uh, thanks everybody for uh, participating and uh, providing your ideas here. I I'm going to share this to uh, Daniel. Um, so, and then if you, well, I'll make it public um, that I'll give it to Daniel to sort of uh, spread it, right? And I I'd encourage you to, to go into the doc and add comments um, if there's any sort of yes and like on, on somebody else's um wishes you know like yes i need this too like that's a very useful comment in and of itself or um you know now now that we have the ideas down if there's any sort of like critical thought on some of these uh not to say you know being mean <laughs> but but just like hey uh, here's why i think this wouldn't be a good idea right that those sorts of things uh would be uh helpful too um and yeah so the you know i'm just this is basically a learning exercise so that we know, um, we know, you know, at least one perspective on uh, where things should be going, which is the node operator perspective. You know, we're also uh, doing similar exercises with developers and uh, folks that are not actually in um, the Web3 space currently, you know, like prospective targets. Anyway, I'll stop there and hand it back over to Daniel. Thank you very much, Brian. Thanks for uh, giving us the opportunity to share our hopes and dreams. And um, yeah, I'll, I will spread the 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 document when it's available. And see you guys all again next week. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Bye. Yeah. See you.